This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And thank you for joining us on Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm James Just. Our co-host is Richard Fields. And with us today is a special guest, Libertarian presidential candidate, Dr. Joe Jorgensen. Dr. Jorgensen, thank you for being here with us today. Oh, glad to be here. Thanks. I noticed the other day that you visited, you went to a candlelight vigil for the Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And here in Sacramento, we have the big Black Lives Matter movement. We had a, a young man killed a few years ago, uh, Stefan Clark, in his grandmother's backyard. And his brother is becoming a big community leader here in uh, Sacramento. And I like your impressions of kind of the movement, what it was like to be at the candlelight vigil. Just kind of tell the viewers what you, how you experienced this. Well, it was great. And the first thing I want to do is distinguish between uh, people who go to a vigil or vigil rather and the protesters and separate them from the rioters and the looters. Because when we see all this rioting and looting, they are often a completely different group of people than the people who are at these peaceful protests. And I look at these rioters as opportunists who are just hijacking the movement. It's a real shame. So. Government cannot, must not infringe on Americans' right to peacefully protest. And in fact, we should encourage it because that's one way that people's voices get heard, that they can make a statement. But we do need to end some of the violence in the police force, which, which has been somewhat uh, caused by the federal government. Yeah, but... no, sorry. How is the federal government causing police violence? I'm sorry? How is the federal government causing police violence? Well, first of all, they've militarized the police forces. What they've done is they have given, you know, paramilitary equipment, tanks, whatever, to local police forces. They've given them extra money to buy other equipment, and they've given them training. So if you look at the average citizen, and uh, you know, whether they're in a town of 5,000, 50,000, 100,000, whatever, and you ask them, okay, um, on a referendum, would you like your property taxes raised so that our police force can you know, get all this equipment fit for soldiers so we can go buy a tank? And the average citizen would say, absolutely not. Uh, maybe you can raise my uh, taxes to buy a new school gymnasium or you know, renovate the grade school, but I don't need a tank. But what happens is the federal government takes money from those same people and then they buy the tanks and offer money to police departments and they say, hey, would you like a tank? And police departments are gonna say, sure, it's free. Uh, you know, I'll take anything free that you have. And just having those around, just militarizing the police force gets them into a different mindset to where it escalates faster. Uh, there is something called the weapons effect in which when you do have a weapon around at, at your disposal, you're more likely to use it and it just changes your attitude. There's lots of calls for defunding the police. And when, when we think of defunding the police, we think about the demilitarization. You take all you, you, you don't right. need as much funding once you take all that away. But I was talking to somebody just today here in town and they say when they have different views of defunding the police, they have a fear that defunding the police means there's no more police force and it's the Wild West again. And so what's your description between those two issues? Well, libertarians and I believe that the role of the government should be police, courts, and military. So absolutely, police would be a function of government. Now, I'm at the federal level, though. If I were president, I don't have the right to tell individual cities how to handle their police, you know, policing problems. First of all, crime is that a crime is a local issue, whether it's uh, stabbing or uh, assault, uh, robbery, burglary. That occurs at a local level, and you need local police to handle it. Uh, the federal government should not get involved unless and until the governor or somebody else says, "Look, we can't handle this. Can we get help?" So, um, you know, right now they they want to defund the police. That that's their right. We'll see what happens. But there's no need for the federal government to step in unless they absolutely have to. Well, what, how much role is the federal government in playing in actually funding the police these days? Do you happen to know? Actually, I don't. But I would su suggest that the federal government should pay absolutely 
no local police dollars. Again, crime and police, uh, those are both local issues. Would, would it be helpful for the federal government to say decriminalize uh, marijuana uh, at the federal level as well as other drugs to give uh, local police less uh, work to do? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I give a few examples. Uh, one thing that I, I do is I ask people, how many times have you heard of a liquor store owner going onto school grounds, going into high school hallways and trying to sell gin? How many times have you heard of people breaking into homes to pay to get money to steal to pay for their vodka habit? And how many times have you heard of liquor stores having a shootout with submachine gun because one of them ended up on their corner? I mean, all of these problems are from drug prohibition, not drug use. Now, personally, my drug of choice is bourbon. Um, I've never been a drug user, never plan to be. Uh, so, you know. If you look at the problems that were from alcohol, most of those problems were during prohibition. And in fact, a lot of people don't realize that when they ended prohibition, use went up just a little bit, but social problems and addiction did not go up at all. There's no evidence to show that any of those problems would increase. But what happened during alcohol prohibition? Organized crime. Right now, where where is a lot of the drug money going to? Again, organized crime. Well, I One talk here, oh, I'm sorry, Richard. Go ahead. Hey, go ahead. Well, I talk here a lot about how drug use is often caused to cover pain, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain. And so we have to do such a terrible job here of even talking about emotional health or mental health. And so is having a Dr. Joe Jorgensen as president, kind of a, a doctor for the for the <laughs> country, so to speak. Is that you know is that a kind of a good idea having a psychologist? In, in the oh, Yeah, I should point out my I, I, I've got a PhD, or as some people would call it, not a real doctor. Uh, and my doctoral degree is in industrial organizational psychology. So I deal with companies with things like motivation, teamwork, leadership. So I'm not the, you know, put the person on the couch and, uh, and help them out. But as far as talking about pain, um, you know, if, if if marijuana had been legal, I don't think we would have seen the opioid epidemic like we've seen now. If people could use marijuana to get rid of their pain, marijuana is nowhere near as addictive as, as uh, opioids. And so we wouldn't have the problem we have now. Although I should point out, I do actually have a certificate in uh, drug and alcohol studies. So I, I do know that end of it a little bit. The uh, one of the you know it's not a, a huge proportion of the federal spending, the federal budget, the uh, the war on drugs, but it is a large sum of money. And of course, uh, as libertarians, we all think that the federal government spends uh, a little bit uh, more than they they should be. Uh, as of right now, we're looking at a uh, spending just kind of going out of the ball ballpark as a result of the coronavirus scare. Uh, back in September, before the uh, uh, the overnight lending rate uh, went from, you know, ballooned from 1% to 10% or something like that. The balance sheet, which is basically the amount of money that the Fed has created out of nothing, was at 3.8 trillion. It's now at 7.2 trillion, almost doubled. Mm -hmm. uh, financial analysts are uh, saying that between the 2 trillion in fiscal stimulus and the increase in the Fed balance sheet or the increase in new money, that we're, we're looking at uh, $10 trillion entering the economy that wasn't there before. I just did some back of the envelope math and figured out that ten trillion dollars over three hundred twenty-one million Americans works out to about thirty-one thousand dollars per person. Uh, where's that thirty-one thousand? I didn't get anything, and uh, I think James, you got twelve hundred. Where's the rest of that going, and what should we, and, and and what's the real solution? Oh, it's ridiculous. Well, first, may I back up and address an, uh, a point that you were making in your question? You were talking about how the federal government hasn't spent a whole lot on the drug war. And I just want to point out that it, 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 with that one, it's not so much the drug war spending, it's the problems that they cause, the fact that our streets are less safe, um, that, uh, you know, that, that we need to give people the, the, the help to be able to conquer their problems in something that's not illegal. So 
if if you look at the drive-by shootings, and that's the most tragic part, is for instance Chicago, which is near, near where I'm from. Look at all the innocent people who've been shot in just you know getting caught in in gunfire, who are completely innocent. These are non-drug users, some of them five years old, you know, don't use drugs, and yet they're getting killed. So with the drug war, I think it's less of a uh, uh, monetary thing. But yes, what we're talking about now is printing money, uh, printing counterfeit money. And what's ironic is we we're talking about George Floyd. That's what he got killed for is have supposedly having counterfeit money. And yet that's what the Fed does every day. And what the average American doesn't realize is that when the Fed prints money, that's like a tax that was passed under the darkness of night that was not passed by Congress. And we've got people's retirements going down. We've got uh, uh, uncertainty. And as president, I will end all deficit spending beginning day one. I will veto you know, every bill, including bailout bills that contain a dime of deficit spending. Yeah, the bailouts are really the, the serious problem is people don't like having Wall Street bailed out while down here on our main streets, or like I told Martin, Martin Luther King Boulevard doesn't get any investment at all. You know, our, our, yeah. our rough communities don't get any investment, but yet main, Wall Street gets billions of dollars. Yeah, so a couple of points. First of all, if you look at the big corporations, uh, if you look at Amazon and Walmart Online, and you look at their sales, January to March last year compared to this year, their sales have gone through the roof. And yet you look at small stores, the mom and pop stores, their sales went down on average about 75%. And most, many, of, most of them to zero because they're, yes, they're, they're that's what, close. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. On average, it was 75%, which meant that some of them shut down and they are never coming back. And so it, and and here we are bailing out these large companies and we hear, oh, we have to bail out the airline industry because we have to have an airline industry. Well, the airplanes are not going to disappear. And I'm not suggesting that everybody should think that the pandemic is around the corner, but if they couldn't manage the companies well on their own, maybe it should go, you know, maybe somebody else should be managing because that's the best part about the free market. And if you don't mind my giving, uh, I, I like to, tell this story as a demonstration of why the free market is so good. My husband and I decades ago bought a house. It was a brand new house. And there were so many things wrong with it, like the wood in the on the kitchen floor curling up. The worst part was in the guest bathroom, the hot and cold water were backwards. And the problem with that is it was in the guest bathroom. I mean, what if one of our grandmothers had come to visit us and they start getting burned and they turn it to cold water to try to, to try to make it go colder and it gets hotter. So I learned a couple years later that that builder went out of business. And I was so glad he went out of business because he should go out of business. He shouldn't be building houses that put people's lives and health in danger. And that's the checks and balances that we get from the free market. So what do we do with all this bailout money? The bureaucrats are spending it, giving it to their friends or special interests, the, the big companies who don't need it. And that money had to come from somewhere. So if it's not coming from us, it's coming from our future taxes. So how about have us keep the money and then we can spend it at the mom and pop stores if that's what we want to do with it. Well, of course, the, the, the reason that we got into this uh, whole, the most recent uh, spending spree and Fed monetary inflation spree is because uh, of the alleged uh, da danger of the coronavirus. Seems to me that politicians on both sides of the aisle are manipulating this issue to their own uh, short-term political benefit. Oh, absolutely. And uh, like I said, they, they passed the, you know, they passed the CARES Act. Yeah, they care all right for the special crony friends and their special interests. So uh, once again, the free market can do a much better job of deciding where the money can go because the average person can decide. And there's a lesson that I learned in grade school that I, apparently they don't teach it anymore uh, from listening to the young people today which is the reason the Soviet Union failed. Actually, when I was in grade school, we still had the Soviet Union, but it was clearly losing to us. Um, 
The reason the Soviet Union failed is because central planning doesn't work. And the example I was given was steel. Uh, you're running a huge uh, country. Where who gets the steel? Does it go to car manufacturers or does it go to um, uh, the refrigerator makers? Well, in Russia, they had to try to figure it out. And how can a few elite decide the entire country? Whereas here, again, the invisible hand. Uh, how do we know where the steel goes? Well, it's who's willing to pay the higher price. So. If the refrigerator makers uh, have a backlog of customers all waiting for refrigerators, they're willing to pay more. Uh, the car manufacturers, if they've got a backlog of customers, they're willing to pay more. So to use Milton Friedman's term of voting with our dollars or voting with our feet, we get to decide where those resources go, not the bureaucrats in Washington who end up giving it to their friends anyway and the big corporations that put them in office to begin with. Yeah, well, and speaking of the, the, the politicians in office, what has disturbed me most about all this coronavirus issue was how we accepted um, laws by executive action, right? Mm -hmm. Governors were just signing the laws and you were passing laws and we all accepted it. So many of us accepted it out of fear, but now we're finding out that a lot of that information they were based those decisions on were just wrong. And you can understand that they were wrong. It was early, everybody was panicking, and you know, information is bad in that kind of situation, but it's just wrong. And that's why, we, as you as president, how would you actually fight that that mindset that government gets to operate by edict? Well, first of all, I would not have shut down the economy so that tens of millions of dollars or uh, tens of millions of jobs were lost. I would not put everybody under house arrest. That's the largest assault on our liberty in my, uh, uh, you know, in my lifetime. What's ironic is my grandfather's family immigrated here from Sweden uh, to get more freedoms. You know, the land of the free, home of the brave in America. And yet, during the coronavirus, while we're all locked up, the people in Sweden have the liberty to walk around and they got to keep going to school and go to restaurants and shopping. So I found that ironic. But I think President Trump made two major problems. First of all, and, and you know, like how could we have kept the economy going? First of all, since 1962, uh, companies have had to prove efficacy of their drugs in addition to safety, which always had been a requirement. And it's, it sounds like a, a nice idea, but the problem is, is it can take a million or up to a billion dollars just to approve one drug. And, you know, because they have so many hoops to go through. And sometimes you don't have the time. And we did not have the time for the test kits. So there were over 60 companies at six zero making test kits. And the FDA originally approved two. Meanwhile, all those other test kits went around the world, so other people got tested. So if people had been tested early on, then people who needed to stay home would know that other people could go out. And um, the other thing is, with uh, that Trump did, is in a press conference, he said, okay, if you don't have symptoms, you don't need to get tested. Well, at the time, the experts were telling us that between 60 to 80 percent of the people were asymptomatic or had so little so little symptoms that they didn't know they had it so he's saying don't get tested so people who have the virus are walking around infecting everybody else if we had had testing up front then we would have known who could go out and who could stay home and we wouldn't have lost tens of millions of uh jobs so I would never order mandatory shutdowns, let individuals and businesses decide, and especially churches. It's really been heartbreaking. I live in the South to see the churches. Uh, these people just have such despair about not being able to go to their house of worship. And of course, I would veto any attempt at bailouts, any. Yeah. Uh, so actually, I should kind of cover that issue. Um, so one of the other things we have about the, the lockdowns around here was there are so many people who are now living in fear, essentially. Mm -hmm. they, they've got what I call cultural PTSD. They're afraid to go outside. And someone who has a lifetime anxiety disorder, it's actually starting to affect me. 15 years ago, I couldn't actually leave my house. And now I'm running for office and all that kind of issues. It's kind of been a long journey. 
Congratulations. But, well, thank you very much. But I'm also now, again, I'm struggling at myself. I have to force myself to go and take a walk every day a couple of times to go outside the house so I don't get trapped inside the house. So how do we kind of fight that culturally? How can we as libertarians and as politicians help people? Because that's what we're all about, right? People aren't going to trust us until they can until they believe we care about them, right? That's kind of how politics works. No one's going to vote for you until they believe that you care about them. So how do we get people people to believe we care about them? Well, first of all, by not taking away their jobs and shutting down the economy. And that's one thing. I'm so glad that the spirit of American individualism is still alive. I'm, I'm just so happy to see many of these protests. I saw the protests in Michigan, you know, people saying, no, you can't lock us up. And what I would do is I would explain to every American that uh, you can't expect compassion from the government. That's why we need to do it through the private sector. And if we go back to accountability, one of my favorite stories is that of the United Way. In the early 1990s, the president spent something like $400,000 on artwork, which by the way, today's dollars after inflation is closer to a million dollars. And the donors said, um, no, uh, we, we didn't give you money to go buy artwork. We gave you money to help people, you know, help people with mental disorders or help people who are poor or help people who are out of a job. And so donations dried up and the United Way had to work hard to get those donations back. They had to gain trust and say, see, we are going to spend your money the right way. Now, look at the government. When they take money to help people, uh, whether to the poor, mental illness, whatever, if they have a lot of overhead, all they do is simply raise taxes. There is no accountability. And the question that I typically like to ask people is if you have an inheritance, like let's say you just got $10,000 and you don't need it. Uh, if you look around and decide who to give the money to, how to get it to people who need help, you know, maybe consider your church because churches are good with that, maybe private charity. Um, when you're considering all your sources, would you consider giving that money to a federal government program? And usually the response is exactly that, laughter. I mean, I would even rather give my $10,000 to Bill Gates, to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, than give it to the federal government. So here's how compassionate I'm going to be. I'm going to allow you to... to spend you know to spend your money so you can make sure it gets to the people you want to help and i'm not going to have the government uh misuse it with absolutely no accountability and and with fewer people getting help james pointed out that he's uh, running for office uh and uh if i'm not mistaken part of your your uh nomination campaign was that you would help uh local candidates as in, the, yes. in the libertarian party as much as possible uh how are you going to help james and other local candidates across the country he's running for assembly uh, in downtown Sacramento. Okay, well, race, by the way. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. What was the last part? In a two-way race, just him and the Democrat. Oh, that's great. Well, first of all, what I usually, what I specifically mentioned was um, uh, helping those running for U.S. House and U.S. Uh, Senate because they have the same issues that we have and we would come up with talking points and give them a place to go to our website to find those talking points. Now, of course, we can't help you with talking points, but you're more than welcome to go to those others because maybe it can give you ideas. But the best thing we can do is grow the movement, which is what we're doing. And uh, yes, Gary Johnson's votes are important. I'm glad he got so many votes, but we, for long-term movement, we need candidates at all levels, which means bringing people in. Now, the one thing we're going to do, which is much different than the past three presidential campaigns, is we are going to share our data real time. Um, we are going to give National uh, the names and addresses of the donors and contact information and allowing them then to pass it on to any local uh, people running for office so that now they have people that they can contact. Uh, what happened with one of the previous presidential campaigns, well, first of all, the last three, they, they promised data. Most of the time they didn't give the data at all. In one of the campaigns, they gave the names of local people like a year later, and that's too late, the election's over. You need names of people now who, who can help you. And again, what's so exciting about our campaign is we've been overwhelmed with how many people are joining the movement 
who are not libertarians. You know, there's a little box where they check or, or an explanation like, why are you why are you helping us? And we expected a lot of people saying, yeah, we're libertarians, but we're getting people who are saying, uh, I just want to see Joe president. <laughs> I don't want those two old rich white guys. So uh, I'm going to interrupt you here for a second, Joe. We've got about three minutes left. And I know Richard wanted to cover some issues about China. So we're going to let him go to cover that. Yeah, foreign, foreign policy. Uh, that The biggest foreign policy issue right now is probably China as a result of the misbegotten uh, trade war, uh, courtesy Donald J. Trump. But also now we're looking at uh, a, a, an imminent crackdown uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, which is technically Chinese property. So, I mean, that, that uh, is going to happen anyway at some point. But the other thing that we're looking at is uh, Chinese uh, threats to uh, extend their influence into Taiwan, if not invade. Uh, and Taiwan, of course, has been in, uh, acting as an independent nation ever since, uh, I think, World War II. What would uh, a Joe Jorgensen administration do in terms of foreign policy, particularly being a non-interventionist, uh, in the uh, face of Chinese uh, uh, threats? Well, one of the main things I can do is to support people around the world by reversing Trump's tariffs. A lot of people don't understand that that's basically a tax, a hidden tax on people. And, you know, the, the biggest thing is, is we can never find ourselves at war with China uh, since we could each obliterate the other. So we have to do everything we can to not uh, not go into war with them. And I do believe the best way to do that is through non-interventionists. And I'm not sure if you're aware that one of my top three issues is to bring the troops home and turn America into one time Switzerland, armed and neutral. Now that doesn't mean a pacifist, of course. Sure, we have to keep an eye out on China and all the other countries, but we're here to defend American soil. If we use our military force against China anywhere else, it's just going to create more problems. So um, if Chinese companies are stealing American intellectual property, I will force them to pay the same royalties as other Americans must pay. And these will put American companies on the level playing field. So this, I, what I think is a peaceful and fair approach to China should discourage their dictatorial behavior and empower free markets. So it would empower the Chinese citizens into um, into being free traders and keep us uh, at world peace. And fostering free trade is is one of the best is one of the major issues here. As they say, where uh, free where goods cross borders, soldiers don't. Couldn't have said it better myself. And that is well, about to from somebody. <laughs> and that is a great place to end the show. We are just about out of time. Thank you, Dr. Jorgensen, for joining us today. For all of you, hey, give, us your, give us your website if people want to find okay. out more information. Thank you for that. Joj2020.com. Oh, you have it on the screen. Thank you. Joj2020.com. Yeah, and you can go to Libertarian. Yeah, you can go to libertariancounterpoint.com. We'll have all kinds of information up there for us. If you are catching us on social media or YouTube, please hit all the appropriate buttons. And from those of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, please remember to love everybody. This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week for the Libertarian Counterpoint.